Good afternoon. I am Marie Prejean Delarge, Omicron Lambda chapter member and team member for Target 4, the arts focus, up close and personal. The arts, yes, it does make life eminently worth living. The arts in all its varied forms improves the quality of life and living for all. Painting, music, singing, dancing, poetry, writing, drama, literature, on and on in excellence. Omicron Lambda Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated is implementing international program target for the arts with enthusiasm while exemplifying excellence through sustainable service. The artsy girls of OLQ have accepted our charge to showcase talent in the visual and performing arts, celebrate the contributions of African-American artists and highlight the artists and artwork of the Harlem Renaissance and Black Arts Movement. Welcome to the arts on a Sunday afternoon as we focus on successful individuals who have chosen careers in the arts field. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our career focus, Up Close and Personal, featuring published author, Mrs. Sybil Moriel. This is a special Black History Month edition. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and special guest, Vitsa and our Sora this afternoon. Now I've known Mrs. Moriel for over 40 years. So forgive me if I call her Sybil upon occasion, okay? Mrs. Sybil Heidel Moriel is a community activist, a warrior for civil and human rights, and a champion for voter registration, education, and the arts. Her contributions to the betterment of society are remarkable. She has played a major role in the Urban League of Greater New Orleans and the League of Women Voters, and was a founder of the Louisiana League of Good Government. She spent most of her professional life in the field of education as a teacher in the public school system and as an administrator at Xavier University. Mrs. Morial initiated the funding and participated in the design of the African-American I've Known Rivers Pavilion in the 1984 Louisiana World Exposition in New Orleans and was the executive producer of the acclaimed documentary, A House Divided which explores the history of desegregation and social change in New Orleans. She will always be known as our beloved first lady for the city of New Orleans. She was the wife of our city's first black mayor, Ernest Dutch Morial, and the mother of Mark Morial, who was also our mayor in 1994. She has received many awards, including the American Civil Liberties, Ben Smith Award in 2019, the Louisiana Legend Award in 2018, the New Orleans Legend Award by Mitch Moriel, uh, Mitch Landrew, 2017, a legend in her own time award by William Faulkner Society in 2016, Women of Power by the National Urban League in 2012, the Martin Luther King Lifetime Achievement Award by Xavier Tulane and Loyola Black History Month activities in 1995, just to name a few. She continues to sit on several community boards and nonprofit entities. And she is the author of her memoir, Witness to Change, from, the, from Jim Crow to Political Empowerment, which was published in 2017. I could go on and shower her with more accolades of her accomplishments and contributions which she deserves. But we're here to discuss how she translated her life's work into what Andrew Young called her story, a New Orleans story from the inside and a history of which we can all be proud. Thank you, Sybil, for being here today. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, we're gonna get down to some questions and we're gonna have, we're gonna make this a conversation between you and our audience. Um, before you were an author, you were an educator. Tell us about those years. I became a teacher. Back in my day, there weren't many jobs for women, uh, especially black women. 
And uh, my uncle was a teacher and a revered principal. My mother was a teacher, but in those days when you got married, you had to resign and go home and take care of your husband and your children. Can you believe that in my day? <laughs> so my mother stopped teaching, but I knew many of her friends and that was a, a, a pro profession that appealed to me. So I went to uh, Xavier University for two years and transferred to Boston University. I was happy at Xavier, but I wanted another experience. So I got my bachelor's degree in uh, at Boston University and my master's degree. I taught in Newton, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston for three years. I taught in Baltimore, Maryland for two years when my husband was in the army and stationed there. And then I taught in New Orleans for 12 years. After which I started a new career at Xavier University um, uh, as an administrator in, in several areas. Mm -hmm. And I love that experience also. Um, you told us you told a story in your book about uh, one of your experiences at uh, Boston um, in Boston at the school you taught about one of the Southern teachers. Uh, she wrote a book, a little book that she wanted to uh, present to her students about uh, Jigaboo. Yeah. <laughs> we know what that term means. It's, yeah. it's a derogatory term and she was so happy to tell me she didn't have any black friends but we were teaching together and she said I want to uh, let you read my ch child children's book and I told her I said Jigaboo is a derogatory word about uh, about black people and she was so horrified that you know she didn't know better but she was from Mississippi <laughs> Okay. Let me ask you about your, 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 your teaching experience. How did that, or did that help you become a writer? If so, how? Well, um, you know, I, um, I wrote my book after Katrina. You remember how horrible yeah. uh, Katrina did to many of us. I had flood and fire. I evacuated to Baton Rouge uh, and lived with my one of my daughters. And when it looked like I was gonna be a while, I, I, mean, I was gonna have to seek permanent residence. So I was in an apartment, but I saw some, a new uh, neighborhood opened up with new houses uh, and I took a look at them. And my note on the new house was less than the rent I was paying. So I moved into this little house, this was a little cottage and uh, lived there while I restored my house, which took several years. And, um, but while I, I, the, the flood took my first floor and everything in it, my photographs that broke my heart and papers and memorabilia. And the fire took what the flood didn't take, papers and all of that. So when I was in Baton Rouge, I was grieving over my loss, especially the photographs and the memorabilia. And each night uh, as I lay in bed, I would just bring to mind one incident and just think about it in detail. Next morning when I woke up, I went to the computer and put that story on the computer. I did that every night until I had about 20 stories. And I said, hmm, I have a book here. And I have bled all over this book. It sort of was cathartic for me. It was healing for me to write down those stories. Mm -hmm. So then I decided uh, I had done a lot of writing proposals and reports and press releases and all of that, but I had never done any writing for people's pleasure. So I needed some help. So I uh, saw that, um, LSU, their evening division, uh, was offering a course on memoir. I signed up, but not enough people signed up to make the, 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 a course. So the teacher uh, who was going to teach the memoir uh, course would, uh, taught a creative writing course. And she said, well, why don't you come to this? You'll learn something. 
I did and I loved it because people in that course were journalists, they were novelists, they were nonfiction writers. It was a variety and I, I just learned so much from them giving their reports. So uh, after the class ended, I asked the teacher if she would uh, help me uh, to transfer from fact, from, you know, uh, uh, non-writing to memoir. She said, I'd be glad to. So I gave her what I had already written and we met every two weeks to review. And she would give me hints like, you need more dialogue or, you know, what was the weather like outside? She said, you're inviting people into your life. So make it really personal. So she helped me so much in that way. It was, and, and, um, uh, you know, we finally came to the end where we had a manuscript. The next challenge was to find a publisher. And I needed a publisher who liked my story. All publishers would not like my story. It was controversial because it was black and white. It was the South and all of that. So we, we, we tried and we were, we were politely rejected. Uh, in a couple of uh, from a couple of publishers and then I got a call from no my friend Rosemary James I don't know if you remember she used to be on television she's a journalist uh, but she's um, a founder and president of the William Faulkner Society and she had a conference every year uh, inviting everybody related to writing publishers and writers and all of that, she invited all those people. She said, Sybil, I want you to come and I want you to submit your, um, your manuscript uh, in competition. And I did, and I was a runner up in the nonfiction section. So because I, I, I was selected, I got a chance to talk to five people, three agents and two authors. And they reviewed my book and told me uh, they, they, they loved it, uh, but they recommended um, uh, publishers for me to, to pursue. But one of them said, well, you know, this is an interesting story, but um, you, need a, you need a ghostwriter. And um, so to, to finish it, I said, you know what? I'm the ghostwriter and I'm done and I'm submitting it like it is. <laughs> so uh, I went to New York the next month to visit my son, Mark. And that was a good time to talk to this man who had told me I needed a ghostwriter. And I called him and I said, I'd like to come in to, uh, to talk some more to you. Um, and I need you to mm -hmm. think some more about my book. So when I went to see him in his office uh, in downtown New York, uh, he said, you know what? I have second thoughts about your book. I know a publisher that might like your book. I, so I sent it to this publisher. It was uh, John Blair Publishing in uh, uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And three weeks later, I got a call from the publisher who said, we, want to give you a contract. We love your book. I almost fell off the chair. I was so thrilled because I wanted someone who loved the story. And so the rest is history. You know, we, uh, uh, she was, um, she, we talked about, you know, getting it published, but also marketing. And she had uh, a woman on her staff who, who did marketing, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, her husband got a job in another town and she left and she replaced her with a woman who was totally inexperienced. Mm -hmm. So guess who did my marketing? My children. I have five children and they have friends all over the country. And uh, they recommend, and so, so this is what they told me. You need, you need one of us to go with you. I said, well, you know, I could travel by myself. They said, well, yeah, we will we'll go with you. And that was so. My uh, Boston University invited me. They did, they, I, I spoke to the faculty, the administration and the students. 
and they had me on their local television station. Um, uh, let's see who, who, Sherry hooked me up with a group in uh, St. Louis and Kansas City. Um, Mark had a party at his house and he had a party downtown uh, for his colleagues. Uh, and after I did a reading, we, we all, we always invited a, a, a local bookseller to come to sell the books. Mm -hmm. and that, that's how I sold so many books. I sold them and signed them. Uh, at Mark's party, I, we sold like 105 books. Oh, wow. Now, also, I was invited. Another hookup that uh, Cherie did was uh, St. Joseph High School. It was required reading for the faculty, staff, and students. Mm -hmm. And I saw a whole bunch of books. Uh, I met the, met with a uh, in the auditorium with the students. It was during Black History Month, and they had to read my book before they came. They had wonderful questions, and in, in most cases, the people who did attend my readings had read the book, so they asked very, you know, significant and uh, cogent questions. Mm -hmm. So I traveled all over. Cherie came with me uh, to St. Louis in Kansas City. Jacques came with me to Boston. Uh, Julie came with me. I went to a Lynx meeting and I, I did a reading and it was in Las Vegas. Julie came uh, with me there. Uh, I forget where Monique came, but my children participated and uh, only Jacques uh, flew with me. Um, you know, I said, I didn't need a babysitter. I didn't need a grandma. I didn't need a mama said I was do fine. But they came along because they wanted to be there because it was their friends, their connections. So that they did the marketing and I am so proud of them. And I sold a whole lot of books through them. <laughs> now I did a lot of readings here too, to various groups and a, a couple of television shows. Mm -hmm. You're making my job real easy, Sybil. You know, you're, you're answering a whole bunch of questions that I had. How, how long was the process with writing and publishing? It took eight years. Eight that's, years. that's when I was gone. I was in Baton Rouge. I was, you know, uh, I was, that, that's all I did. Yeah. Okay. Perfecting it, you know, getting it, you know, not remembering stories after I had put it together. I still have some stories I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up some kind of way that uh, got cut because it, my, uh, my editor told me, she said 250 pages is enough for, you know, for people to really wanna read it. If it's 500 pages, they're gonna say, mm, no. Okay. So we cut out a lot of stories. So I'm trying to figure out how, now how to get those stories to my readers and I'll, I'll get there. So we're we looking at a, a follow-up book. Yes, okay. I don't know if it's right. gonna be a book. I don't know how to couch it. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm still thinking about that, but those stories are really good. And when I re re uh, sent them to my children, they said, oh yeah, how did you, why did you leave this out? I said, I didn't, they cut it because I had too much information. Well, one of my questions was gonna be, how did you organize your life into your life experiences into chapters? And now I know the answers was you had to cut out some things and and uh, rearrange some things because that seems to be a hard thing to determine what that goes was in. a challenge. But it was uh, uh, you know beginning with my childhood and those experiences living in uh, New Orleans, which was a rigidly segregated town. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning to, to, to see how I grew up and how it really uh, made me who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, being denied all those young years, but my parents always gave me hope. They said, oh, one day it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. And they would um, subscribe to uh, Black newspapers, not just in New Orleans and Louisiana, but all over the country, the Chicago Defender, in Chicago and the Afro-American uh, newspaper in Baltimore and others. And so they kept up with what, with, with what was coming, especially when the court case uh, Brown uh, and, and when I was in Boston, 
uh, we used to go to the black section of Boston to get the Pittsburgh Courier and the Afro-American. So we would know because that was when Thurgood Marshall and his team was arguing the case in before the Supreme Court. Oh, wow. And yeah. so, you know, I, we, we, we just we, we just stopped everything to, yeah. to get it and talk about it. Now, I was in school with Martin Luther King. He was at Boston yes, University was. working on his doctorate and I was in undergraduate school. There were many uh, black students in, in the universities in, in Boston. There were many universities in Boston, but all of the black students in all of the schools knew each other through sororities and fraternities and other networks, the black network all over the country. And we used to meet, we had parties and we would meet and talk about the situation in the South and that change was coming. And although all of us from the South love the freedoms of the North, we could go wherever we wanted to go. We could go to the Apple, we could go to the Boston Pops, we could go to the theater, we could sit down in a drugstore counter and have lunch. We loved all those freedoms, uh, but we all wanted to come back South because we wanted to be a part of the change. And of course, Martin was our grand leader and he was, uh, usually almost every Sunday, a guest preacher at one of the predominantly Baptist churches. And we would find out and we would all go to hear Martin speak. And he is, you know, he's a gifted speaker. He, he, he was an ordained minister when he was working on his doctorate. So I, we all got inspiration from Martin because he knew we were gonna get to the promised land. <laughs> Uh -huh. Let me ask you, um, you talk in your book about going to Africa on one occasion when you went to Gori Island mm -hmm. and how it um, really uh, made a profound impression on you. And I know that many uh, Blacks are able to trace their ancestry and don't know or didn't get any stories passed down to them about their grandparents and great grandparents and beyond. You, on the other hand, knew a little something about some great grandparents and eventually were able to trace your ancestry. Tell us about that story and its connection to the Whitney Plantation. Okay. Uh, we had, um, the, my maiden name is Heidel and it's a huge family. My father was the oldest of nine children and, and six, six boys. They had a lot of children. So we, we have a big clan. And we had two major uh, family reunions. Uh, one was back, was, was uh, at, on the River Road, not, in, not in, in the Whitney Plantation, because it need, which is where my great, great, grandfather was born a slave, but we had it in another plantation because Whitney needed, uh, was uh, being repaired. My, one of my cousins, Belmont, did deep research and found out a lot about Victor, who was uh, my slave great-great-grandfather. And with all of my elder cousins putting in the story, he got it kind of together, but, um, uh, and I, we learned uh, that Anna, who was the African that came over on the slave ship was from Senegal, but the deep research was done for the Whitney Plantation. John Cummings, a white lawyer, bought this plantation and he decided that all of these tours to these plantation homes talked about the wealthy uh, plantation owners and not what made them wealthy. So his, his restoration of the Whitney Plantation tells the slave side how they live, the slave quarters and in depth and did more in-depth research on my family because Whitney Plantation is where my family uh, originated. My American family originated with Anna, the African slave, and 
the brother of the mistress of the plantation. You know what, what they did back then. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so she, uh, the mistress of the plantation also had a nephew, which was the same age as Victor, my great, great grandfather. And so he got some advantages playing with this uh, uh, white uh, uh, little boy just like him. So, um, but the restoration of Whitney has really brought my ancestry to light and to the public. And um, I am, I was interviewed by uh, my daughter-in-law, Michelle Miller, uh, CBS, asked her to come down and do an interview with me. And one of the questions she asked was, well, how do you feel about it? Um, I said, well, let me tell you how I feel. This, my great, great grandmother was enslaved and brought here and bought and was owned by this family. And she had one son and that multiplied. But each generation did better. But I need to tell you this. We also, we also used to go to the graveyard where my uh, grandparents are buried, where, where my family who lived in Edgar uh, on the River Road, um, we would go every, every uh, All Saints Day to the graveyard. And it was like a picnic. We would all meet. And it, it had, you know, greens all around the graves and everything. And I would hear my cousin Sadie and my cousin Wilbereen. Oh, they, they would talk. And when my sister who, and I, my sister was a year older than, than me, we would get close so we could hear what they were saying. And when we got close, it got quiet. So we knew there were secrets <laughs> that we didn't know about. Um, and cousin Sadie was a, a favorite grandchild of Victor, the slave. And so she would, she would sit on his lap and listen to him talking to all his buddies. Uh, and so she could tell some real stories. So we learned a lot, but we never heard the word slave. Now, Jean and I figured out from the time and the dates mm -hmm. that somebody had to be a slave. And so um, uh, it, it was revealing to find that out. But each generation did better. Victor's sons, my, uh, one of whom was my grandfather, Clay, Clay Heidel, he owned land. The brothers got together and bought land and they sharecropped that land. The next generation did better. Now, after during Reconstruction, they, you know, they, blaze, slaves weren't allowed to learn to read. Uh, but during Reconstruction, which was after Emancipation Proclamation, they established schools for the ex-slaves, but only up to fifth grade. Mm -hmm. They wanted them to be literate because they, they were handling stuff at the plantation. But that was the end. But my grandfather, Clay, cousin Sadie told me this. She said, your grandfather, Clay, wanted his children to be educated. And he had nine children. He, he, was, a, he was a poor share, sharecropper. So she said, um, Clay said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my oldest son, who, who is smart, I'm going to send him to school and ask him if he will help his siblings. And that was the deal. First, he had to, after, uh, after fifth grade, he sent him to New Orleans uh, to finish elementary school and high school and college, straight college, which is now Dillard University. And he, he had to promise his father that he would help any of his siblings who wanted to go to college by paying their tuition. And he did. Of those eight siblings, Four of them went to college. Two women, no, three, three of them went to college. Uh, two women who, who became teachers. One who was a chemist, who, uh, who, who was a, a business owner. He manufactured hair products for African-American hair. And it was very successful. But then the next generation did even better. 
uh, my cousin Belmont had a florist shop. It was down on South Haven Avenue and it had a big showroom. I don't know what that was before, but all glass and he featured all his floral arrangements and so forth. And he got contracts from white churches to do uh, flowers for Sunday mass. He did it for black churches, but he also did it for white churches. So he was very successful. As I say, my uncle Whitney had these uh, hair products and that was successful. Uh, uh, two cousins got the uh, Esso franchise. They each had a gas station. First blacks to have an Esso franchise way back in that day. So in the, all of them didn't have college education or even professional education, but they were smart and they improved each, each year, uh, each, each generation. And when it came to my parents' generation, of course, my father was a physician, my mother was a teacher, um, but my generation, everybody's college educated. Everybody has professional degrees, uh, graduate degrees, you know. So that was the evolution uh, from slave to the present day. And so um, Michelle asked me in the interview, she said, well, what do you think? I said, you know what? I'm so sad to think that Victor had to live like that, that Anna was treated like that. But I am so proud of the successive generations that brought us a step higher. They had some grit inside that pushed them forward with the little that they had. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of people out there who are um, maybe thinking about writing a book. What suggestion would you give them? It's more than a notion. <laughs> um, you have to think about it a long time and maybe make notes. You know, why am I writing this book? Uh, is, is it just a story that's in my mind that just keeps saying, I want to come out? Or do you want to tell a family story? Or do you want to do nonfiction? You have to ponder over it for, for, for a long time. And then I think you'd have to get some help because writing a book is a major undertaking and you do need some professional guidance. Um, now, I know there are people who are talented and so forth, but um, most people will need some professional guidance somewhere along the way. See, I wrote and wrote and wrote before I even, uh, found that class. Uh, and um, so what I'm saying is that don't be shy, even though you know, you, you know how to write. Uh, if you're writing nonfiction, that's a, if you're writing fiction, it's a whole other thing uh, than what you've been doing. Uh, so uh, you can take a course at the universities, one of the universities. Um, you can find, another writer who can be your uh, mentor. Uh, but have yourself together, have some idea of what, of what you're gonna tell, what is your story about, before you get some help, a mentor, a professor, take a course, you know, and so forth. Uh, you, I, I don't know many people who can go it alone doing their first book. Now, some can, they're just gifted. Uh, but not all of us are gifted. I know we've just touched uh, the many stories you have in your book, and, and maybe we'll have to come back to you and, and ask you to come to our meeting or uh, and give us a, a reading uh, uh, in your book. Um, but I want to thank you uh, for having this interview with us, and we really appreciate it, Sybil. Uh, you, uh, whenever we call you, you, you're always so gracious, and I want to thank you. Well, it's my pleasure. You're my friend, <laughs> aka. Why wouldn't I? This is really an honor. Okay. Well, thank you, and have a and uh, have a good afternoon. This is the uh, arts program on a Sunday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.